Okay. All right, when I first thought about the next session with Dr. Park and the team, I thought, nobody thinks about rehab. Dr. Park and I had a wonderful lunch down in Tucson when I was here a few months ago. We talked about this program. Like, this is going to be really exciting because she told me things about rehab that I had no idea. So I am going to just turn it over to Dr. Sarah Park and the team to tell you why rehab should be yes, 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 not no, no, no. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that fabulous introduction. So um, I'm so glad to be your facilitator today to talk about cancer rehabilitation. This is something that I am super passionate about, and I hope you will be too by the end of this conversation. Um, so I'm Dr. Sarah Park. I work at Tucson Medical Center in Tucson, Arizona. I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician there. I also have a practice at Mayo Clinic here in Phoenix and uh, trained at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. I know some of you um, have been patients there as well. So um, I know the West very well. I also did my residency at University of Washington, so Fred Hutch. Um, and so I'll be providing a brief introduction to cancer rehabilitation and then introducing our wonderful expert panel here, and I'll be facilitating some Q&A with them. And then hopefully you guys will have some questions for us also, so please save those for the end. So everyone in this room knows very well that bladder cancer impacts quality of life. In a study in 2019, we saw that about nine out of 10 survivors did not have their supportive care needs met. That is staggering. Cancer rehabilitation attempts to meet that gap. So we take a patient, evaluate their physical function, their psychological function, their social and vocational needs, and then put together an individualized rehab plan for them. You may not have heard of this field before, but it's been around for almost 100 years. It was first conceptualized by Dr. Howard Rusk in the 40s, and then really picked up steam in the 60s and 70s with Lyndon Johnson's Commission on Cancer, and then in the 80s, 90s, and so on, the major cancer centers really adopted this. So MD Anderson Cancer Center, Memorial Sloan Cancer Center, hired physical medicine and rehab physicians, hired physical and occupational therapists, speech therapists, and this really got going. Um, what's very new, however, is the formal training. So in 2007, MD Anderson had their first fellowship graduate class and then for physicians, and then uh, in 2019, the Physical Therapy Association had their first graduating class. So um, those new certifications are what's really novel. Cancer rehabilitation traditionally has four phases. So uh, this is called the DEETS model of cancer rehabilitation. And we think about when patients are first diagnosed, being really proactive and helping them to address any functional issues that may predate their cancer. If you have knee pain, neck pain, things like that, we can help you. Um, so that you tolerate your treatment the best possible. Once treatment's underway, this is restorative rehabilitation, so getting you strong and feeling as best we can during that tough phase. Um, once treatment is finished, uh, we have supportive rehabilitation sometimes. Unfortunately, we have metastatic disease or, or treatment that continues uh, daily chemo pills and things like that. We need supportive rehabilitation through that phase as well. Um, and finally, palliative rehabilitation. So for those of you who uh, may have advanced disease, metastatic disease, palliative uh, medicine is very helpful for symptom control, and rehabilitation can be helpful as well to improve your quality of life. Make sure you have the right equipment, make sure your family's trained, and that kind of thing. Overall, the concept is that we start out with a certain level of function, we pump up your function, and then if there is an event like a surgery or other functional uh, insult, then it's easier to get you back to where your, your pre-morbid functional baseline was. So what makes cancer rehab different from regular rehab, regular PT, OT, that kind of thing? There's really a few different um, things. One is it's proactive, as I mentioned. Uh, the other is this important medical knowledge we have to be able to screen for uh, potential complications from your treatment, keep you safe during rehab. Uh, the other is this holistic approach, so treatment across the care continuum and really working with a multidisciplinary team. Um, most importantly, we consider the big picture with all of this, so taking into account 
not only those difficult kind of end of life conversations and, and that sort of big picture, but also as we talked about earlier, this is expensive, it's stressful. So taking into account financial toxicity, appointment overburden and all these other features. So it's my pleasure to now introduce our wonderful panel and facilitate some Q&A with them. Uh, Dr. Koenig? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much uh, for having us here. Uh, my name is Francesca Koenig. I am a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician like Dr. Park. Uh, so I'm board certified and trained in cancer rehabilitation as well. I did my fellowship at, in cancer rehab medicine at Sloan Kettering, where I stayed on board as an attending there uh, for a few years before I decided to switch the skyscrapers for the mountains and I came to Colorado, or I went to Colorado and I've been there since uh, last fall. So heading up the cancer rehabilitation program at the University of Colorado now. My name is Eliza Neufeld. I'm an occupational therapist. I'm also a revital cancer rehab specialist and a Lana certified lymphedema specialist. And I'm from Arizona, born and raised. I've attended all three in state schools, um, but I did get my doctorate through uh, NAU, but downtown Phoenix campus. Um, so I love the desert. I intend to stay here forever. <laughs> um, so for those of you who aren't from here, welcome and enjoy the weather. And my name is Elena Newell. I'm a physical therapist and I am double board certified in oncological physical therapy and women's health physical therapy. Um, I'm the director of education for Revital Cancer Rehab. We're a national based cancer rehab institute that's an outpatient therapy. So we have clinics down here in Arizona that Elisa is a therapist at as well as throughout the country. So depending where you're at, we can have more conversations. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for coming and joining me. Um, we'll start out with a few questions for Dr. Koenig. We'll kind of move down the line and at the end, um, we'll just have a little discussion and hopefully welcome your questions. Um, so Dr. Koenig, I know a lot of people aren't as familiar with our specialty with physical medicine and rehab. Sometimes when I say I'm a, a rehab doctor, they think I'm a PT or maybe a podiatrist or a psychiatrist or all sorts of other things. So. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you know what makes our specialty unique? Yeah, so um, as you've all seen in the in the slides, we've been around for decades, but apparently we've done a terrible job at marketing ourselves <laughs> as physical medicine and rehab. And like Dr. Park said, we've been called everything. And while we appreciate all these specialties and dabble a little bit, maybe sometimes in each of them, um, I, I tend to describe myself to my patient as a physician that focuses on function and quality of life in a patient with cancer along their cancer care continuum. So usually this looks like things um, within the realm of the musculoskeletal, neurologic, lymphatic, and functional systems. Um, and we know that, of course, you know, our oncologists are our godsend, right? They're, they save our lives. But Dr. Park, I heard you once say, and I, this resonates so much with me, I heard you once say that cancer rehabilitation medicine physicians save lifestyles. And when I see my patients um, day in and day out, that's really what I am focusing on. What is important to my patient in their day to day, they, you know, at whatever, again, stage they are in their cancer journey, um, I want to optimize their quality of life uh, and function. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And um, yes, I, so I'm married to a radiation oncologist, so we always joke that he saves lives and I save lifestyles. Um, it's the dream team. <laughs> the dream team. <laughs> so um, how, do, how are we different from physical therapists? Because that's another thing oh, sometimes yeah. we get confused, physical medicine and physical therapy. Yeah, and a lot of the times I get the question, well, why can't I just see a physical therapist? And while I very deeply appreciate yeah. you all, and we are basically nothing without our, our physical and occupational and, and, and skilled therapists, um, you know, we each have our expertise that complement each other, and we are nothing without each other, essentially. Um, and so, you know, what, what we do from the physical medicine and rehabilitation standpoint um, is, again, we're bringing that medical point of view so we can help diagnose conditions from there, you know, is, for example, like, is the tingling in your hand from a neuropathy from um, your chemo, or is it from a pinched nerve in your neck? We can help diagnose these things and then guide the physical therapy or the skill therapy uh, and prescribe that. Um, and so we also, um, being physicians, you know, we're able to order x-rays, imaging, MRIs, we can order blood work, um, we can prescribe medications like nerve pain medications, muscle relaxants, things like that, and then we can also perform injections. Absolutely. Um, it's a very dynamic practice, I would say. It's very individualized. What, what we offer to each patient is going to be um, unique to their situation and their impairment. Um, how do you partner with supportive services? And, and what is your 
sort of program usually look like for our bladder cancer patients? Yeah, so when, when the patient is referred over to me, um, again, I'm taking a look at that big picture. What cancer, right? What the treatments are? Um, what other comorbidities or other medical issues you have that are not related to the cancer that can affect um, your, your function, quality of life? What are the psychosocial factors, right? So taking all of that big picture into account, um, again, we're um, not going to toot our horn, but we're really good at diagnosing um, things within, again, the musculoskeletal and neurologic realms. Um, and then, you know, we can certainly prescribe the, you know, the, the, uh, the skilled therapy that's needed in cases where, you know, if a patient may not need a course of skilled therapy, you know, we can provide detailed exercise prescriptions for patients. Um, speaking in the line of therapy as well, when is it right to do, when is it the correct time to do physical, occupational, speech, all these types of therapies? Um, we want to be uh, judicious as well in the, the timing of this. Um, of the skilled intervention. Um, like I said, we prescribe medications, um, x-rays, uh, imaging, all these types of things, injections. Um, and then like you're saying, we, we collaborate a lot with supportive services. So I'm a big fan of interventions that can provide potential good benefit, low risk acupuncture, right? Um, massage. There's going to be contraindications to those too. For example, if your blood counts are really low, you may not want someone sticking a needle in you because there's going to be a risk of bleeding, right? Um, you don't want someone putting, if we're thinking about massage, you don't want someone putting deep massage over an area that may have bone disease, right? And so when we're thinking about um, these other services, we have to think about, are there contraindications to that? And that's where we come in and, and help. Um, a big part as well of what we do is education, expectation management. What should you expect from a functional and quality of quality of life standpoint as you're undergoing your treatment. You know, your oncologist is telling you you're going to get the X, Y, and Z. They're probably going to tell you you're going to feel fatigued. You're going to feel like not that great. What does that look like specifically? We can help um, set those expectations during treatment and beyond. Um, the only thing I would add also is just supporting expectations for caregivers um, mm -hmm. and sometimes providing resources for caregivers that want to, you know, do the best by their um, partner and going through this. I think of us a bit like a quarterback where we know um, all the players on the team and we know when to pull them and when to put them in um, and, and what their skill set is so that we keep the, keep the care efficient, really, and efficient and effective um, for all these ancillary services because it can be really overwhelming. Um, thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction to PMNR. Um, Dr. Neufeld, so OT, occupational therapy, is also um, an area that I think is a little less well understood. A lot of my patients, when I tell them I'm going to send them to occupational therapy, they're like, well, I already have a job. I, so can you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I hear that a lot. Um, occupational therapy seems to be kind of the, uh, the stepchild of the therapy world. No one seems to know, like, why we're here, what do we do? Um, so what occupational therapy is, the main focus is that word occupation, it throws people off. And what occupation really is, is the day-to-day -day things that you do. Every task, everything you do is considered an occupation of your life. So that's why we call it occupational therapy. So what we focus on is what do you need to do every single day in order to function, participate in all the activities and roles that matter most to you. So we are unique in that we're not just looking at your flexibility, your strength, your endurance, those kind of biomechanical factors, but who are you as an individual? What matters to you most? Why can, can you not do that? And how do we fix it? And not just through rehabilitation physically, but also modifications and adaptations. Um, so we're just a little bit more holistic in our approach and looking just a little bit broader. So I often recommend that people go to both because we work in tandem to make sure that you can do all those things that matter. Exactly. So mm -hmm. these are things like getting dressed and bathed and Absolutely. that kind of thing. Maybe uh, explain what ADLs and IADLs yes. are because those are terms that get thrown around. Yeah, they, they are our bread and butter of terms. So an ADL or activity of daily living are those very, very basic tasks. Getting dressed, using the restroom, taking a shower, doing your hair, brushing your teeth. These are all activities that you have to do in order to function independently. So we don't just look at the physical ability to bathe your body 
or use the restroom, but also the environment. Can you do it safely and as independently as possible? So again, a little bit more broad spectrum to the picture at hand. Um, instrumental activities of daily living are kind of the next step up. Prepping a meal, doing your laundry, those sort of day-to-day -day household chores. Um, that's where we focus on that. But we don't only focus on the physical ability to do these and those kind of impairments, but also do you have any cognitive or fatigue related issues that might be getting in the way? Sometimes you can physically do it, but after all these cancer you know, treatments, you can have a lot of fatigue and cognitive decline. And so we are uniquely fitted to be able to look at all those different aspects and figure out how to best help you and give you to tools to participate and be as independent as possible. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Curious, what inspired you to go into OT? Uh, yeah, so my uh, trail to OT was a little uh, windy. <laughs> um, I went into, I originally was actually gonna be a physical therapy assistant. Um, this is my second career in my life. So I was older going back to school in my late twenties. And um, so I figured, okay, I liked this area of rehab. I had a family member, my brother passed away from cancer. He had um, juvenile cancer. And so I knew I wanted to work in rehab and with cancer patients on some level. So uh, I was already older, had a family, fast track to my next career. And then it turned out there was a two year wait to get into PTA school. <laughs> so I said, well, in that amount of time, I can finish a bachelor's degree and go to PT school instead. Um, and that seemed better. <laughs> So I did that. And then thankfully I was introduced to somebody through my husband who was an OT. And she let me come and shadow her at the neuro um, down here in South Phoenix. And I just fell in love with it. I loved that holistic pro approach. I remember working with her and she was working with a gentleman who had had a stroke and his goal was to dance with his daughter at her wedding. And so it was just that perspective. She wasn't just saying, oh, you can't move your arm the way you could before, or your balance is off. We didn't care about that. We cared about, can you dance with your daughter at her wedding? So that, and that was the end game for me. I went straight to OT school. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what conditions do you treat for bladder cancer patients, survivors? So for bladder cancer, it, there's going to be a lot of that kind of toileting aspect. Um, we do have some area of expertise in bladder control. We can help with that. We can also help with building routines, you know, some um, in order to facilitate independence with that and avoid any issues. Uh, there's also um, a lot of issue with the cognitive and fatigue levels with being able to get dressed and just take care of yourself or participate in your roles. Maybe you're a grandparent and you want to be able to play with your grandkids or um, you love to golf and you just can't get out on that golf, uh, on the golf course, how can we make it so you can do that? We want you participating in life. We don't want you to stop doing the things that you love. Um, and then another big ticket with bladder cancer is lymphedema, which is the main thing that I personally do. It's my main love. Um, and lymphedema is chronic swelling, um, in this case, uh, due to cancer related treatments radiation and uh, surgeries, lymph node removal. Um, so we have a specialty in that. PTs can also specialize in that, but there's a lot of subspecialties in which we overlap, <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that. I, um, I know that patients who come to see me sometimes have never heard of lymphedema. Um, anyone in this room um, never heard of lymphedema? Okay, awesome. So maybe we can just have you explain a little bit more about, you know, what lymphedema is, a little of the physiology and how the most common treatments for it. Absolutely, I'd love to. So, <laughs> this is, absolutely love to. Uh, yes, lymphedema is very much um, not diagnosed as much as it should be. And uh, usually it's gotten pretty far by the time someone notices it's happening, unfortunately. Um, and it is very common with cancer, but also with lots of other issues. It can be caused by uh, cardiac edema issues. It can lead to lymphedema, kidney issues, um, all diabetes, un uncontrolled diabetes can lead to it, venous insufficiency, there's a, l a lot. And there's also primary lymphedema. Some people are just kind of born with it. Um, but for this particular case, 
you're most likely at high risk in order to get lymphedema if you've had lymph node removal. And the more nodes that they've removed, the higher your risk category. Um, there does seem to be a little bit of a genetic component to it. Some people can have five or six nodes removed and not have an issue. And then someone said, oh, they only took one just for a biopsy and now they have lymphedema. So it's really a little all over the board. So what you wanna look for out, out for symptomatically is um, abnormal swelling and I past the post-surgical. You're gonna have swelling post-surgical that's normal. But if that swelling seems to be persistent and possibly even continuing to move down your legs or into the abdomen, and after about two, three months when really that surgical swelling should be gone, it's still there, that's a good time to ask for a referral to get checked out by a lymphedema specialist. Um, if you have any kind of pitting, meaning that when you touch the swollen area, you leave an imprint, it can kind of feel like peanut buttery under there or memory foam, that's a sign you want to look, uh, look out for some help. Uh, some sort of less common signs that people might ignore, just kind of a feeling of heaviness. If all of a sudden it seems like just walking up those stairs, your legs feel heavy and you just can't seem to figure out why, um, and not because of fatigue, but they just seem a little heavy, it's also a good reason to go ahead and get checked out. And um, you can see your physician, your, your primary care, your oncologist, and mention that to them, or if you do have a physical medicine and rehab physician, um, feel, you know, certainly mention that, and, and there's some um, physical exam history and, and even diagnostic testing to um, look into what the cause of the swelling might be. Awesome, thank you. So um, moving on to Dr. Dr. Newell. Um, um, so a lot of people in this room probably are more familiar with physical therapy. Um, if you've had you know, a shoulder injury or your knee replaced or anything like that, maybe you've had some PT. Um, but can you talk about some of the subspecialties in PT and especially those that might be relevant to our bladder cancer population? Yeah, absolutely. So let's try to raise a hand. Who's been to a physical therapy? for anything, not just for cancer. <laughs> yeah, so like they said, we're the ones usually people know who we are, but what the different areas of PT we're in is not always as common. So in PT, we have about 17 different subspecialties, which is a lot. Um, and so you may be referred to a special type of physical therapy at different times. The ones that we see more common related to bladder cancer are our public health specialists. So they deal with any bladder, bowel, or sexual dysfunctions. You also may be referred to somebody, we also work in lymphedema as well, so you may be referred from that standpoint. And then the other big one of our subspecialty is cancer rehab. And these therapists have had additional training outside of their normal PT school to understand what kind of treatments you've all gone through and the side effects and how we can best help support that. So a lot of people think of PT as we, right, we're good at helping reduce pain and get you back to moving again. A lot of people think of us as the movement experts. So areas we often treat are helping with fatigue or really one of our biggest ones is weakness. I don't know if anybody feels they don't have the same stamina or they can't do things as easily from their strength. That's where physical therapy often comes into play for bladder cancer and really helping rebuild your body back up to get you back to doing the things that are important to you. Um, as Lisa said, we work a lot in tandem. So we often say, well, they can physically do it. They can go up the stairs, but what's our limiting factor? As working as that team to figure out maybe there's some other piece that we're not seeing. And, and so we really help get you moving again um, and working with the team to figure out the different components. What are some of the techniques that you use? To do yeah, that? so we have a, a whole plethora of things we like to do. You may hear manual therapy. We like to put our hands on you help get some movement back maybe to some joints or get some tissue moving better. Sometimes after radiation, we people will see if they have scar tissue or they just don't have the same flexibility. We can definitely help manual therapy in that standpoint. Exercise is a really big part of what we do in cancer rehab, helping you individually figure out exercises for where your weaknesses are and where you need to get back moving, but also for what you wanna do. So cardiovascular exercise, strength training, balance work, comes into big play, especially if you're experiencing, experiencing neuropathy. Um, we do have some modalities we use, but I think our toolbox is always a lot smaller than our physician counterparts, and so there are some times we do that, but that's where your cancer rehab therapist comes into bigger play, because they'll know which ones they can do that are safe for you, versus a general type physical therapist may not know when they can use different, different aspects of their therapy care. 
That's great, thank you. Yeah, I love to work closely with the physical therapist because um, often they'll have questions about the safety and mm -hmm. precautions. Um, and so we work together very kind of hand in hand to make sure that um, what we're doing, like I said earlier, was is efficient and effective, but also safe for the patients. Um, uh, speaking of that, what contraindications do you kind of commonly keep in mind when you're doing exercise or, or manual work with patients? Yeah, I think that's where understanding your individual case really helps us out as therapists. So that way, technically nothing's off the table, but for individuals at different time points, it can be. We know when you're going through treatments, um, maybe your immune system isn't as strong. And so we want to be mindful of not using certain modalities or being more careful if you're at an increased fall risk and your blood counts are low. Those are things that we have to be really mindful. And so while exercise is good for everybody, no matter what time point, being what types of exercise can make a big difference. And that's where we're kind of therapists to understand those pieces can be a big deal. Um, wonderful. So just changing gears here for a minute, uh, as you're talking about immunity, I was thinking about um, pandemic and some one of the silver linings I'd say of the pandemic was the advent of telemedicine. Are you guys using telemedicine in your practice? I know I do. Yeah. Um, so I, I definitely like to implement telemedicine. For that first visit when I'm meeting a patient for the first time, I do prefer that to be in person because that that physical exam is going to be so important. Like, like Dr. Newell was saying, we like to get our hands on our patients, um, and a physical exam really is going to determine the best plan of care for that patient. So that first visit, I always prefer it to be telehealth, or in person, sorry. Um, the next ones, I, I, I do like to implement telehealth. Um, you know, for example, if I get an MRI of your shoulder, uh, instead of schlepping you all the way over to clinic to review it, let's do it on telehealth. I can go through the images with you. You can see it and ask me questions um, in real time. And for check-ins too, patients who may be coming from a little bit further away, I always like to coordinate visits as best I can with the oncology teams or other visits that they may have. Um, but sometimes that's not the case and I want to check in and I'm not going to have them drive five hours to just see me. Um, so that's, that's, a good, um, that's a good way to use telemedicine in, in medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, as of right now, I think you're able to do it across state lines in the physician practice, but unfortunately not across state lines in the therapy practice, but currently you are doing it within state, right? We are. It definitely has shifted a little bit as the pandemic's moved along. Um, one thing that we're always being conscious of is, are you safe to be able to do some of the therapy by yourself at home, or do you have support there with you? There are sometimes, specifically if we're doing balance training or different activities, we want that person to be with you. And so it really depends on what you're working with the therapist on, if telemedicine is a good option or if it's better to have you in clinic. And then certain things that we'll kind of talk about, like lymphedema care, really you, hard. You, yeah. you could not do lymphedema <laughs> care through telehealth. It requires hands-on treatment every single time you're, you're there. It's, um, so we don't do that telehealth at this point. But um, part of it can include training family members to do a lot of the type of treatments we do so that we can maybe reduce the frequency of coming in person and have family help take care of it at home. <clears throat> um, speaking of, so what do you guys feel like is the best time for the patient to, to present to you? When in their course should, should they seek out your services? Yeah, so the beauty of cancer rehabilitation medicine, like you were talking about um, Dietz's phases, is that there is a role for cancer rehabilitation medicine at whatever part of your cancer journey. Um, I'm a big fan of prehab, so getting our patients optimized prior to their treatment so that we can plan for the best, right, as patients are undergoing through treatments and then throughout the, the cancer course and into that, um, that maybe advanced stage. So um, that, again, is the beauty that there is, there's a role um, and it's appropriate at whatever point. Yeah. I would agree. Um, for me, uh, especially with the lymphedema piece, there's a push where we're trying to get doctors to send um, patients to us just before they even you even start at diagnosis, basically, so we can do baseline measurements, education on those signs and symptoms that I mentioned earlier. And then that way, if you start to suspect there might be an issue, I have something to compare it to. And there is a threshold when I do those measurements that tells me, yes, there's something clinically significant here. There is a change. So having those baseline measurements is really helpful. Um, but that being said, at any point, I have patients who have had lymphedema for decades. You can still come in and we can help it. We can get it better. So at any point in time. 
Yeah, and we're in the same boat. I always remind people though, the best time for therapy is when you're ready for therapy. So if you're saying, I can't mentally handle another thing right now, we understand that and we'll still be here and we can help at any time point. So if you're saying, wow, I didn't know about you and I've gone through treatments, that's okay. Don't, don't stress about trying to go back in time, but if you're noticing symptoms and changes now, we're here and, and we're not here just acutely after treatment, but throughout the rest of your lifespan. Mm -hmm. So realizing some side effects may not happen right away, you may have things later on, and we can help address those at any time point as well. And that's actually one of my favorite roles is actually helping the patient to decide when, when's the best time to go to therapy and which type of therapy to choose. Um, just to kind of help navigate that complex you know, situation depending on their, their broader picture, their transportation issues, financial issues, uh, you know, time toxicity is real with, with all the appointments that um, the oncology teams ask us to attend. So um, I just put up some resources. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Newell, if you want to talk about the first couple and sure. kind of um, as I, we had said in um, 2019, we had our first class of uh, board certified oncological physical therapists. And so if you're looking for a physical therapist, particularly the American, American Physical Therapy Association, on our website, there is a find a therapist button and that'll find you any type of PT, but there's also a find a, a specialist. And that's where if you search in for cancer, you'll be able to see where the certified um, cancer specialists are in your area. Uh, there are other um, therapists who may not have sat for their board certifications yet. Um, our organization, Revital, we're spread throughout the country. Um, particularly, we have clinics um, in the Arizona area, California, Washington, so this kind of western region. We're about to move into Kansas City and Kansas in general, but we're not quite there. Another place you can find therapists is through, um, it's called PORI, uh, the Physiological Oncology Rehabilitation Institute. That's another education company that is training therapists how to better care for people with cancer of all disciplines. So you'll find PTs, OTs, and SLPs are speech language pathologists. You can find them through that organization as well. So there's not one stop, unfortunately, to find a therapist, but between those three, we'd hopefully find somebody in your area. Uh, so another great resource, especially if you suspect you might have lymphedema, is the Lymphology Association of Northern America. Um, it is a, um, a certification that a lymphedema certified therapist can get that's kind of above and beyond. I like to describe it as getting, as having like your master's degrees in, as a CLT, as a certified lymphedema therapist. If you have that LANA piece, you've passed an extra exam beyond just being certified to show that you are proficient in, in, in treating lymph, uh, lymphedema. So, they do have a great button right on the front page, find a CLT. It will not be an exhaustive list of anyone who's a CLT in your area, only people who are LANA certified. Um, but it is a great resource to find them because we are hard to find. Uh, there is not very many of us. I know right here in Arizona for Banner, we have, well, we have five currently. I know we have one coming in June in the East Valley and a couple more on the docket, I'm hearing. So that would put us at eight for the state. Um, so it's, there's not too many um, to find, but we are here to help and we will get you in there. Um, so go ahead and find us there. National Lymphedema Network is a really great resource just for lymphedema information in general. They have conferences throughout the year, which are phenomenal to learn more about it. So I would absolutely recommend checking that out if you have any questions at all. Yeah, it, yeah. From, from our standpoint, we unfortunately don't have um, a, a similar resource that you can just type in, find a cancer rehabilitation medicine physician. Um, so we are also kind of scattered around the nation. You see here on this map, mainly on the East Coast, um, but uh, scattered out uh, uh, in, in several regions. And hopefully, you know, as more folks graduate, as more physicians graduate from these fellowship programs and are trained, you know, the, the trend is for them to go and start up cancer rehabilitation medicine programs at cancer centers. And our goal um, nationwide really is um, for each cancer center to have a cancer rehabilitation medicine trained physician, right? This is an essential service that our patients need. And, and I know we agree it should be, you know, part of the standard of care in cancer treatment is to have a cancer rehabilitation medicine physician on your team. Mm -hmm. 
So you can see this map is something that um, our, we have a cancer rehabilitation physician consortium. So we, we put this together through them, um, through our national organization. And um, you'll see Dr. Koenig in Colorado and me here in Arizona. Um, so uh, it's pretty sparse. Uh, the, the California providers and the um, provider in Washington just started within the last two years. So um, as the fellowship programs have increased, uh, we. We now have eight fellowships around the country. Um, when I, when Francesca mm -hmm. and I trained, there were only four, so um, it's really increasing rapidly. And I think uh, you know an important thing if you want to be seen by a cancer rehabilitation medicine physician or a physical medicine and rehab physician is to ask your oncology team. Right, if you're at a university center, a cancer center, more likely than not, there will probably be someone that's at, at least PM&R, um, right, and then can have that outlook of importance and, and em emphasis on function and quality of life. So even if they're not formally fellowship trained in cancer rehabilitation, all uh, physical medicine and rehab doctors should have at least some um, education in this space and comfort. And they will be really excellent at um, the parts that we've mentioned as far as diagnostics of musculoskeletal and neurological com concerns. And then um, that organization piece, because really, uh, what we've historically done is a lot with patients with severe disabilities, so spinal cord injury, brain injury, amputation, things like that. So we're very used to complex medical concerns and um, navigating through systems that may not be advantageous for that population. Uh, so any physical medicine and rehabilitation physician, uh, other than I would say those that are strictly interventional pain, mm -hmm. they may not have this um, level of interest and expertise, but those general physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors in your community will be a good resource. Mm -hmm. Other suggestions or thoughts that you guys have? Because how many now think differently about rehabilitation and what it could do for you? Anybody? <laughs> so I think, you know, there are all kinds of programs that are meant to make your lives better, to help you thrive and survive, to continue with the activities of daily living that bring you joy, that are essential to who you are. Life after bladder cancer diagnosis and treatment might be different but it can be a good new normal. So I think that's something that I'd like to open it up now for questions. Anybody have a question? My name is Doug. My question is. Hi, Doug. Hi. Hi Doug. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I uh, was diagnosed with bladder cancer three years ago, and I had a robotic radical cystectomy with ileal conduit two years ago. And I had a great result. Everything works fine, generally feeling well. I've had one ongoing negative uh, effect from the surgery. I never had it before, so I'm assuming it's related, is uh, sort of a, a on, ongoing intermittent burning and pain in my lower abdomen, which I kind of think of as a, like an abdominal wall neuralgia. I don't know if that's what it is or not, but um, I didn't see a specialist. Uh, yeah, I didn't see a specialist. I worked with my primary care physician. And several weeks ago, we started gabapentin. And it's been extremely effective. It's, very, it's helping quite a bit. So it sounds like maybe that is, it's not far-fetched, that that may yeah. be accurate. Do you see that much? And how do you treat it? Yeah, some of the similar things that you're saying, right? Um, gabapentin, Lyrica, Cymbalta, these are all nerve pain medications, right? And I, I implement them a lot in my practice. I do tell patients, though, that these are medications um, that aren't going to heal nerves, right? They're not going to fix nerves. We use them as a Band-Aid. Sometimes we need a Band-Aid. These Band-Aids can be removed, but Band-Aids can stay on for a while if we need to as well, right? Um, so, so that is certainly an intervention um, that we use. For certain types of nerve injuries or nerve issues as well, a, a nerve block can be done that can provide maybe a little bit longer lasting relief. And for patients who maybe you know, are, are experiencing side effects on gabapentin or other nerve pain medications. Um, and then also a lot of times, referring over, right? Yeah. To, to PT as well, um, core strength outlet to, you know, 
Yeah, so say, we're like, oh, it possibly could be, right? Because it definitely sounds something we hear before. Um, and realizing when you have surgery, they move a lot of things around, and sometimes our nerve can get irritated, and we can help figure out is there some scarring that maybe is impacting that, or your strength has changed in that area. And so um, pain just gives us an idea of something that may have been changed, but there's definitely ways we can work with that um, to kind of help see if we can reduce the symptoms. But I think the, the, the dual work is always the important part, because if you're in a lot of pain and discomfort, therapy can be harder to do. And so it's like, let's take that Band-Aid, and then as time goes, we can work to see if we can help um, the body readjust to the induced presentation. I, I was just going to add that um, I, I have seen that before. Um, yeah. And we also see it in other populations, um, particularly post-thoracotomy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, patients get pain sort of in a nerve distribution that corresponds to the um, intra uh, the nerve that runs along the nerve, or runs along the rib, rather. Um, same thing with breast cancer survivors. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we see post mastectomy pain that can be in sort of either in a, in a clear distribution of a nerve or vague, more vague across the chest wall. And we treat it very similarly, um, just what these guys have described as far as some um, nerve pain agents. Sometimes a nerve block is necessary, therapy, manual work, especially um, restoring posture. So it tends to be. Um, effective. Just as a follow up on that, you know, it's not fairly new on the gabapentin, but as long as it's working, we'll just continue that. And also, my dose is 600 a day, and it's going to continue to increase. Can you answer that question? How would you dose that? So, gabapentin is a, a I always tell the patients it's a kind of a wild medication because the range is from 100 to 3,600 milligrams per day. Um, so it depends a lot on your tolerance and um, the side effect profile. Um, but yes, the usual starting dose, I would say between, sometimes they start 100 or 300 at night, um, and 600 is by no means a high dose. Start at 100 Yeah, and usually there's sort of a sweet spot. Another thing I'll say though, just to, to end on that is that um, one of my biggest pet peeves for patients is getting stuck on medications they don't need to be on, right? Yeah. And so at some point, if you feel like your symptoms are okay and you wanna try coming off of it in a graded fashion, we taper off these types of medication, it's reasonable to do. And play around with it, if your symptoms come back, you go back on. I just, you know, I, I always hesitate when folks are on medications, they don't know what they're on and not saying that's your case, but you know, folks are on gabapentin sometimes and I ask them and they have no idea why. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that, that depends. That's very individualized, but that depends, yeah. yeah. Well, doctors can't answer really important individual <laughs> questions because they don't have this big picture. How do you know? I, I, not this question. I'm John. Two parts. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, John. <laughs> Tips to get ready for surgery in just over a month mm -hmm. and post therapy mm -hmm. to get back to doing water sports. You know, starting, you have to have your knees to your chest. Is that possible to get back that flexible? Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, so when we think of before surgery, the more time we have is usually better. Think of any time you're trying to get ready. Let's say you're going to go on a trip, right? Do you want to get ready the night before, or do you want to get ready the couple of weeks before? Usually it's nicer if you can spread it out, you can get more done, you can feel more comfortable, you can get stronger, same situation. So as soon as we know when surgery is, that's usually when we wanna to try to start to build or strengthening. So that way we can, keep, we can get that ramp as high as possible before you go into surgery, so you're as strong as you can be going into there. Um, when we think of pre-surgery, there's two areas we really focus on. One is building your cardiovascular strength, meaning your ability to walk, ride a bike, swim, things that get your heart rate going. That one's a really important one in terms of how you tolerate through surgery. And then the other big half of that is building your strength or building your muscles up as much as possible. No matter what, all of us, if we sit too long or we lay in bed too long, we're gonna lose muscle. And so the more we can build that up before you go into surgery, the, the, what you lose is not gonna impact you as much as you would if you're weaker. So A, starting as soon as we can. Um, I think we had a slide that has the ACSM yeah, exercise. Just, I just yeah. turned away. So there's a guideline to the American <laughs> College of Sports Medicine, and they have a thing called exercise as medicine. And these recommendations come from a big panel, and what we really shoot for is 150 minutes of aerobic exercise, a moderate intensity aerobic exercise a week. 
So that'd be walking bigger, like a moderate walk, 30 minutes for five days a week is what the goal is. And then two days of doing strength training for all your big muscle groups. Um, and so that is where the gold standard, no matter where you are in your continuum, going in before surgery, you know, a little bit, give yourself recovery time after surgery, and then through life is what we try to achieve. I think your other question was, can you get back into the water, right, after surgery? Yeah. Is that the other half of it? Yeah, yeah there's definitely, it definitely can. Usually we want to give you some time to make sure your incision's healing well mm -hmm. and making sure your physician's kind of cleared you to go back into the water. Because the infection has to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's some safety considerations, but it's certainly doable. Um, yeah. It's just a matter of, you know, um, what type of surgery you have. And um, if you do end up having an ostomy, sometimes we can make some modifications um, mm -hmm. uh, to make that safe for the water. And um, so I, I would say the other pieces of prehab that I'd recommend are not only the exercise, but we also, um, uh, the nutrition panel that we just had, so in implementing especially those protein recommendations. Um, for patients that are protein deficient, I usually recommend somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 five grams per kilogram of body weight um, for patients, as, as was mentioned in the panel, if they're um, otherwise doing okay on protein, one um, gram per kilogram of healthy body weight. Um, and then the, the whole foods and everything we just heard on the nutrition panel, I thought was wonderful advice in that prehab phase, especially and with recovery. Um, and then the third part of a, a traditional multimodal prehab program would be a, the psychology of it all. So if you're having a lot of anxiety, depressed um, symptoms, addressing those ahead of time, employing mindfulness techniques, music therapies actually got great evidence, um, and then habit formation, so quitting smoking, making sure our drinking is within moderation or quitting that, um, you know, having healthy habits in general, and, and talking through those with your physician, kind of having an honest, um, an honest conversation about those bad habits that you may take this opportunity to kick. And then I would, again, just highly recommend finding a local certified lymphedema therapist and getting those baseline measurements, just in case. Mm -hmm. You might never see them again. A lot of times that's what happens with people who come to see me for baseline. I meet them once and I never see their faces again. But for that 10% that does come back, it does really help us determine whether or not you have an issue. And then you already have that person there. So I think it also alleviates the stress of it if you do start having a problem, you're already in the system, you already have a connection, and then you don't have this whole process of finding it because it can be a bit of a process after the fact. The other thing I'd recommend is if you have a cancer rehabilitation physician in your community at established care, ask your oncologist for referral so that they can help guide you through these different phases. Oh, yeah. I, I just want Hi. to say one quick thing, sorry. Oh, I just want to bring, I didn't mention it before. Lymphedema doesn't just happen in your legs. It can be anywhere in your whole body, including scrotal, penile, vulvar, anywhere. And that can be a very sensitive topic. So um, I would really, really recommend, don't be shy about it. If you have an issue, we're used to it. We do it all the time. Come in and get help because we can help with swelling anywhere in the entire body. Go ahead. Oh, hi. I'm hi. Tom Clark. I'm from, I'm from Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, thank you for being here and doing this. Really appreciate it. And uh, were, my, I couldn't quite hear. You were discussing something earlier with the symptom. One of the symptoms was heaviness in the legs, climbing the stairs. If you could go back over that briefly. And also tell me, uh, can one of the symptoms be parathesia in, the, in, in feet? Thank okay. you. Uh, I, I mentioned it as a possible symptom that can be indicative of lymphedema, an onset of lymphedema. It can also be weakness. You know, it's something that we would want to bring you in and physically assess. And there's a lot of different um, ways that we would do that. There's different assessments that we would put you through to determine, could it be lymphedema or is it just a weakness issue post-surgically? Um, or post-cancer rehab. So if you are having those kinds of issues, I would very much recommend finding a local specialist to have it checked out. Now, what, what, what is it and what causes it? In the... 
exactly. uh, lymphedema. Yes. Lymphedema is caused by disruption to the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system's job is to remove fluids out of your tissues. Your blood gives your tissues all its nutrients, and then the lymphatic system's job is to take all the waste away. When that lymphatic system gets damaged, the fluid gets stuck, and then you get a buildup into swelling, which over time can thicken and become pitting or hard. So it's really important if you're having these issues to get intervention because it will not go away on its own. It's a chronic issue. Once the lymphatic system's damaged, it's damaged. It does not regenerate. Um, so that's what lymphedema is. Lymphedema is chronic swelling that cannot be, that will not go away on its own due to damage the lymphatic system. Okay, and the uh, numbness in the feet, that sounds like more like a neurological problem. Yeah, okay. so, so that does sound like a nerve injury, neuropathy. Um, if your legs are very edematous, meaning they're very swollen, mm -hmm. you can, those symptoms can feel a little bit worse of the neuropathy, but lymphedema would not cause neuropathy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's very see, clear. Thank you so much. And I think from that, we see numbness and tingling and paresthesias in cancer treatments more commonly for other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if we want to kind of touch on that, because yeah. I think that's, we haven't talked a whole lot about that piece of things we help treat. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the types of chemotherapy that are used in bladder cancer, especially the platinum-based uh, chemotherapeutics, those can cause neuropathy, which is um, damage to those little nerve endings. Often uh, they manifest with symptoms in the hands and feet. Um, sometimes we call it a stocking glove distribution, so um, to the knee, to the wrist. Um, and it's, it's usually a sharp or tingling sensation, sometimes worse when you're trying to fall asleep at night or uh, may wake you up at night. Other people don't have the, um, the tingling or, or sharp sensation, but they just have numbness. And um, the numbness, uh, while you know, not necessarily painful, bothersome, it can impact your function a lot, um, especially when you're walking, you're not getting great feedback from those feet, and um, you're more at risk for a fall, you may not even know it. Um, so if you're stumbling, catching your toe, and thinking, I'm just a little clumsier, that might be a sign of neuropathy. Um, or if you're having trouble doing buttons or doing fine, fine motor um, skills, that may be a sign as well. So just things to consider if you've had exposure to chemotherapy. Yeah, <clears throat> my name is Ray, and I'm curious if lymphedema, if you see it, with both like BCG and a vesicular, in a vesicle, I can never say that word, or um, just the immuno through the veins or like the bladder wash. Can it be both? Uh, lymphedema can be caused by a lot of different things. Um, a lot of different things. And a lot of times with people who have lymphedema, um, it's usually a variety of different things that create a perfect storm to now develop into lymphedema. Um, and then there are other um, diseases such as lipedema, which is a, probably another one you've never heard of, um, that can lead to lymphedema as well. But with this particular population, the most common reason to end up with lymphedema is due to damage to the lymphatic system through surgery and radiation. Surgery meaning a TERP? Surgery being lymph nodes removed. Yeah. So. What okay. we think about it's more of surgery to the lymphatic system, not necessarily just surgery to the bladder mm -hmm. itself. Okay. Yeah, it has to be sort of direct disruption of the so, lymphatic, yeah. mm -hmm. um, whereas the TERP is, is more local to the bladder. Hi, my name is Richa, and my question is, uh, we've been talking about the lymphatic system. Um, and all these things happen with uh, as you progress. But is there any, there are many devices also which people use to keep the lymphatic system in a healthy state. So like, I don't know whether you've heard, I've heard of Beamer uh, and many such uh, which keep the lymphatic system going. So what is your take on it? And do you recommend something which we can do it beforehand, which helps keep it going, yes. in keeping it going. Right, uh, so if you're speaking beforehand, the most important piece I would say is physical activity. 
your heart pumps your blood, your muscles pump your lymphatic system. So if you are very sedentary, you're not moving your lymphatics. So that piece of staying active, back to what she said about the 30 minutes, five days a week of walking, um, particularly for the lower, your, for your legs, your calf muscle pump system is the most important pump system for, you, for your lower extremities. So walking that heel toe strike um, is really important. So if you have kind of a more shuffling gait for whatever reason, um, using a walker, you tend to have, people tend to shuffle their legs rather than doing a real good step. Getting into prehab physical therapy to get that better gait and walk can really help improve that. Um, as far as exercise goes, our gold standard is in the water. Water provides natural compression. If you think of that pressure of the water against the body, um, so you get the compression, which helps the lymphatic system work more efficiently, as well as getting your exercise in a really safe environment. You're not likely to have falls and things like that like you would on land. Um, to answer your question about the devices, so um, often once lymphedema has developed, our standard of care for lymphedema management is called complete decongestive therapy, CDT. And it involves four components. It involves massage, compression, skin care, and exercise. Um, there are compression garments. There are custom compression garments that can be made um, or you know, off-the-shelf compression garments. Those would be recommended by the lymphedema therapist and you'd be measured for those. And then um, the massage component, you can perform self-massage. And if it's not feasible, then there are um, pneumatic compression devices. Uh, and there are several brands. but. Um, sort of the most, I guess, known one and, and the best evidence is for the tactile um, plexi-touch pneumatic compression device. It's hit or miss as far as insurance coverage on that. Um, that actually brings me, I, I didn't ask yeah. you guys, but everyone always asks me, does insurance cover this? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Across the board. Yeah. Yes. Um, I will put a caveat on that, though, um, for lymphedema purpose, purposes. Um, they will cover you coming for lymphedema therapy. Um, and I will also say for the massage piece, manual lymphatic drainage is the massage that we do for that. It is not the same as if you look at Massage Envy or whatever massage parlor and they say lymphatic massage. That's a fad, it is not the same thing. Yeah. Please don't go there. Um, and I, people have done it and it hurts and I don't know what they're doing, but it's not the same thing. Um, so, but for insurance purposes, in December, the Congress finally, after 12 years of hard work, passed the Lymphedema Treatment Act. And what that is doing is requiring Medicare, starting in January 24, to cover the cost of compression garments. At this moment in time, they do not. It is an out-of-pocket cost for that. Um, but starting in January, they will. Uh, two cost, custom or over-the-counter, depending on your needs, garments a year. Um, there will be some other things coming down the pipeline, but they're still negotiating and finding all of the finer details. There is a website. If you just Google um, Lymphedema Treatment Act, you can get to their website and they will be updating that. There's a really good FAQ sheet that is as up to date as possible at the moment. Um, but we do know that they will be starting to cover the garments. Um, it doesn't have any impact on the coverage for the pumps, unfortunately, um, and that is pretty hit or miss. Um, but it will require you to go to lymphedema treatment with a CLT. I can tell you that. They want you to do at least four weeks of conservative treatment, which includes treatment with someone like myself, wearing compression, exercise, um, all those good things. Um, and then usually we can get it mostly covered, if not completely. And another caveat I'll just say real quick is that for the physician standpoint, there's no necessarily like a cap on how many times you can see us, but for PT and OT, your insurance may have X amount of sessions for yeah. each mm -hmm. specialty. So that's something to consider as well throughout your calendar year um, when insurance um, then gives you new new availability to sessions. Okay. Thankfully, we're two separate buckets. Yes. So. <laughs> Another session coming right up. So Dr. Patel, come on up. I saw you come in.